Kia ora, te lofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast, Aotearoa's greatest sporting podcast. We are here to chat through Tauihi basketball finals, we've got a little bit of football, the football ferns have a squad announcement, Aotearoa has a bloke in the Champions League, which is pretty cool, Chris Wood is trucking along nicely with Newcastle as well. We've got a black cap squad to face Australia in the coming weeks that we'll touch on as well, and we've got NRL Finals footy brewing. So we're going to dive into that uh, fringy top eight situation, everything else is kind of locked and loaded, so we'll just chat through some of that fringy top eight stuff and probably the excellence of Joseph Tarpany, to be honest, because the Canberra Raiders are my team in that fringe top eight situation, and Joseph Tarpany is the bloke. He's the main man, and he is awesome. Earlier in the week, we recorded the Variety Show, which is hard and fast, bit of a magazine-style show, but it's also weird, it's also funky, and you can check that out on all the podcasting platforms. However you get your podcast, make sure you subscribe and, and tell a friend and support the uh, support the content, support the korero, uh, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's Apple, whether it's Spotify, however you do it, make sure you're su subscribed and you're uh, enjoying the mahi. Every week we also record a Patreon podcast for the Patreon Fano. Patreon is the best way to support the niche case straight up the guts if you can. It's a very generous platform to give and uh, for us to receive, but also flip the scenario. We provide an extra cricketing podcast every week, just something small at the moment. And if you're willing and able to support the niche case and support everything, the website, the email, the podcast, everything that we do, Patreon is the best way to do that. Patreon.com forward slash EL niche case, L niche case. And that's there we are. Uh, Greatly appreciate the Patreon whānau for all their support, and it's always there if you'd like to support the Niche Case directly. Otherwise, make sure you're uh, following the podcast and all the content, checking out the website, the niche case, the niche case.com. Always big Aotearoa sporting yarns to be found there, so check that out every day, every second day, or if you're off grid, maybe once a week. That's all good as well, don't mind that. Because we also have the email news that are dispatched on a Monday and Friday evening. Tomorrow is Friday, so that will be sent out tomorrow. And that's another good way to get off social media and just uh, enjoy the niche case content coming straight into your email inbox. Easy as. All the links to the website, everything you need for the podcast, as well as bonus yarns. We always whip up a couple paragraphs, and by a couple of paragraphs, we mean probably at least 30 paragraphs each, I'd say. So it's always good value covering only Aotearoa sport. So basically, we've got a website, thenish-case.com, only Aotearoa sport. We do podcasts every week, only Aotearoa sport. And then we've got the email newsletter dispatch as well, Monday and Friday evening, touching on only Aotearoa sport. That's what we do. We love Aotearoa and we love Aotearoa sport. So we just zone in on that. And there's plenty of ways to absorb that information as well as supporting the movement and the mahi. We start our podcast with a dose of mindfulness to get the uh, get the blood flowing. This is the um, the warm ups, you know, swing a leg, swing an arm, touch your toes, wiggle the hips, and depending on what sport you need, need to you're you're doing, you've always got some uh, specialist warm up activities. We do a Kiwi sporting podcast, so our specialist warm up, up activity is mindfulness. It's like uh, throwdowns in cricket. You don't do throwdowns in rugby, but you need to do throwdowns in cricket as part of your warm up. Uh, rugby, bit of handling, that's, a, that's specific to rugby or rugby league. And mindfulness is specific to the Niche Cash podcast, Wildcard. What do you got? Yeah, you got you to warm up for what you're. Um preparing to do don't you um yeah here's one for you i last night you'll be interested to know i watched the first episode of the the latest tits and dragons show and so as a um i don't know in honor of that i i googled george rr R. martin quotes on to find something for mindfulness and actually the first one that came up was a bit of a banger so uh it goes a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies the man who never reads lives only one
not a big book reader myself, so I'm on the <laughs> but wrong. He end. doesn't specify book reading. You know, he doesn't specify that. He just says reading. There you go. Uh, what What's your interpretation? Well, I like the idea of. Um, I think you can take that from there into like the empathy that you get from art for other people. Like if you, um, cause the way he says is like, you live a thousand, like if we're saying every time you read a book, you're like, you're living that person's life kind of thing. Um, whether it be the author or, you know, the character or whatever. And I would say the same applies to movies and the same often applies to me, like any kind of to music, to, um, you know, paintings, even like any kind of art that's put together where it feels like the person who created it put a little piece of their soul into it. You know what I mean? Anytime that's the case, you get a little piece of their soul back when you like absorb it, when you, um, when you watch it, listen to it, hear it, whatever, like um, view it, you know? And that just helps you to find a little bit more understanding for someone else's perspective. You know, like if you, if you see that, you sort of get a glimpse of, um, of what they were feeling, what they, what they want you to feel way, what they put into the, to the artwork. And then, yeah, I mean, we each technically only get like, we'll, we'll put aside the, the concept of reincarnation for a second here. We <laughs> say we each only get like one attempt to live and we, our one life is, um, is heavily influenced by our, like our own, this is something that comes up in mindfulness, these chats all the time, like the, our own perceptions define our reality and stuff like that. But if you can connect with a piece of artwork that someone else has created, put a bit of their life into it, then you get that little bit of their life. Like you get a little bit of someone else's perspective and that's just a, a healthy way to live is to be able to, to understand where other people are coming from at, at all, you know, times and stuff like that. Beauty nothing to add there good uh good mindfulness Sweet. and go. good explanation good interpretation and good uh scene setting for this podcast and our artistic expressions our creative expressions here for aotearoa sport we start with tauihi basketball finals wildcard where i believe the northern kahu are taken on the fi in the first game both of these are going down friday evening and then you've got the toko manawa queens they are taking on the mainland porkai northern kahu seem like the best team and they have the best player talia tupaya who was uh graced with the uh big donny of the season award is there Obviously, they face the Fi, and there's only five teams, so the Fi finished fourth. So, in theory, the Northern Kahu should be far too good for the Fi, and then it will be up to the Poakai and Queens to battle it out for that other final spot. Are you entering this uh, weekend of finals basketball feeling like it's the Northern Kahu who reigns supreme and are going into this whole weekend as uh, favourites, or do you see... Yeah, just how are you feeling about the Northern Kahu entering this finals weekend? Yeah, I I remember thinking, just seeing the squad list at the start of the season before anyone had even played anything, thinking the Northern Kahu were the, were the best team out there. They, they, they had the best roster. I expected them to, to be pretty dominant, and they were. Like, they weren't always... I don't know. I, I watched a lot of their games and they weren't always like flawless. They weren't blowing teams apart. There were a lot of like grind them out wins, but they did tend to find a way to win one way or another, whether they were on top of their game or not sort of thing. And yeah, 10 wins out of 12 games is, is pretty handy. And because of the format of the thing, five teams and four making the semis, uh, they play a team that had a losing record in, in, their, in their semifinals. So I would, I would be very shocked if they don't win this game. And I would, I'd be surprised if they didn't win the whole title. I think they were a really good team. Um, as you say, Talia Tapaya, the, the MVP, um, Australian import, I, I believe. Um, they've also got a good Kiwi presence there. Uh, you know, Michaela Cox, I think, was the only New Zealander to get amongst, only New Zealand player to get amongst the, the award things. Every, everyone else was an import. The MVP, best defensive player, best young player, all this. But Michaela Cox was in the All-Star 5. So, um, 
that that's that's good. That's good for her. Um, good for Kiwi basketball. At least someone snuck in there, a, a Tall Ferns legend in the um in the process. Um, who else have they got? They've got. Uh, well, let me whip up their thing actually, just quickly. Um, Crystal so, Ledger Walker is probably the other star. I think. Um, haven't seen that much from old uh, old what's the name? Um, uh, fucking mind blank here. Um, played college last year, so there's. Let me look up the thing because she she's been injured a little bit lately. So whether that's back or not. Um, well, so just but, so, so the All Star Five, there are two Kahu players in the All Star Five. You got Kyra Lambert, Michaela Cox, Talia Tupaya, Jamie Nadet, and Lina Snyder. Cox mm -hmm. and Tupaya, both of them are guards, right? Like Tupaya is quite big for a guard in theory if she is a guard, but she does the games I've seen. Yeah. She does dominate the game, like with the ball in hand and just doing everything for the Northern Kahu. So. The Kahu have two of the best players. They have the best player and another player who, as you said, was the only New Zealand player in the All-Star 5. So it's pretty impressive from the Northern Kahu. And they are two players to watch. Yeah, um, Akini Tara Reid was who I was trying to think of before I lost my mind for a second there. But um, she had a, like a starring college role. I think she might actually be... Because she got to do the extra year, because everyone who was who played during COVID got given a free year of <laughs> eligibility. Um, so I think she might have actually ended up beating Michaela Cox's all-time like Kiwi record for for points scored or something like that in in Div One NCAA basketball. Like I think that might be the case. She might not have got there. Or something. Either way, she had like a very distinguished college career. Has been a little bit hampered by. A, injuries, and also just a lot of other good players on the team also wanting the ball and getting up shots and stuff like that. Um, so maybe haven't seen quite the best of, um, of Tara Reid, but I'd, I'd almost say the same about Crystal Ledger Walker, to be honest. Haven't quite seen the season that I thought we might, but she's still been steadily solid. Like, great passer, um, not really a scorer, but really good defender, great passer, um, will knock down shots now and then, and she's an important player for them. But yeah, um, Talia Tupaya has been the dominant player for the um, for the Kahu, for the best team, and Michaela Cox as well as a, as a yeah, a, again, a Tall Ferns legend, getting out there and playing outstanding basketball at age like 35 or whatever she is, making the All-Star 5. That's a good sign of class right there. And yeah, sneaky point guard kind of activities from her. There's, there has been a little bit of that, like a lot of really good players having to sort of make sacrifices to fit each other in. But you see at the end of, this, end, of the, um, end of the regular season, you see what that looks like though, like a 10-2 and two record, top seed favorites going into the finals. Like they were, they're a class team and they'll do, yeah, they, they'll take a lot of stopping from any of these other teams. The Kahu and Queens are the only teams to score over 900 points in the season. So, and they both had, like, obviously first and second, they've got the most wins. And the Queens have uh, Florencia Chagas, who was named the Young Player of the Year. I think she is Argentinian. Yes, Argentinian. Yeah, I think so. so um, another one of these imports. How... Like just thinking about what I know about women's basketball, like a lot of the women's NBA, WNBA teams, players, they pick up gigs all around the world when their season is not going on. And some of the players competing in Tauihi might be from WNBA as well. It seems like like it is a it is the first campaign, so it is like a balancing act. You don't want too many dominant imports so that the Kiwis have no opportunity to develop themselves. But I think in this edition of Tauihi basketball, the international players and their level of play, but also their you know international experience, their mana is going to be fantastic for all the other teams and local players as well. So it could be kind of skewed as a negative thing, not having any Kiwis as dominant players in the um, competition. Um, the award winners, the best players, they're mostly international overseas players, but just they're, they're like uh, just watching them play and how they fit into the teams. As you said, like there are like, you're trying to fit some really good players into a few roles and it takes sacrifice. It takes like not stuff that we usually associate with uh, 
overseas professionals across all sports in Aotearoa. Usually when you get the overseas professional at your local club, they're not going to sacrifice too much. You know, they're going to be wanting to be the big Donny and take a lot of the responsibility and ownership of the team's performance. But I think in this Tauihi basketball season, there is a good integration of the best overseas players with the local talent and kind of hoping we do see some local players step up in finals basketball with these uh with these four two games and and also a final on top of that um between the two winners so the three games <laughs> split the difference um yeah Tokamanoa Queens did beat the Kahu in the most recent meeting that uh, that was after the Kahu had already clinched first place so it maybe wasn't like fully fully locked in um from the from the minor premiers there but they do feel like the most likely team to to be able to challenge them to do to be able to beat them if they do like because the Kahu do have as we're saying like um you know Crystal Ledger Walker and Michaela Cox in particular are going to be two pretty dominant um you know Kiwi players on the floor in crunch time for the Kahu in in the semi-final and potentially in a final afterwards uh might not be so much the case for the queens for example um they've got you know they've got chagas there they've got i think jamie narrod was in the american import was in the all-star five um gustafsson i uh, can't remember her first name but she's from sweden i think there's real like global feel to that team but um yeah like on the one hand you'd rather Kiwi players dominating alongside them, but that's not going to be the case. Like there has been a difference between the the imports have been a bit of a step above, uh, but also like I don't know, like they that raises the bar, and it is the first season, and you are trying to establish a league, and you want a fairly high quality, you want to put a good product out there. That's kind of how you do it, and then like you look at that um, Tokamanoa Queens team, like uh, who who's a good example. Um, Lily Taulele is on the bench for them. She's like 17 or something like that, plays for the, all the New Zealand up, like up and coming age group teams and stuff like that. That's kind of perfect for someone like that's development. So you like to still be at high school and you're playing with like um, overseas professionals from all around the world. Like that's, it might not be something that in year one, that that is hopefully not necessarily going to be the case in like year five or year six to this competition, where hopefully you've raised the bar for, for the Kiwi players and improved the competition to that extent. You're still getting like similar caliber um, imports, but then also Kiwi players are fitting right alongside them and dominating for multiple teams, not just like the one team that has, that is able to bring back a couple of the best players kind of thing. But in the meantime, I don't, I mean, I, I struggle to have a problem with that as long as the league is doing well and you've still got young players being able to absorb that kind of, um, that kind of environment and they will be the ones to take the league forward in those, you know, year five, year six, year seven kind of thing of this, of this competition. That's, I don't know, that seems like a perfectly fine formula to me at this stage. Who is one player or some combination even that you're just have to have to watch and you're, you're recommending um, Kiwi sports fans to make sure they tune in to one of these games just to see that combination or see like a rising star of Aotearoa basketball or some overseas freak? Like what's your what's your recommendation based on what you're excited about? Um, well, there was a game earlier on in the season where Tiana Clark had like nine three pointers for the for the Mid North Fi. I, yeah, that's who she plays for. Um, she had like nine three pointers, which I think was a well, it's definitely a record for this league because it's the first one. Um, she's been playing a lot of three x three basketball for for Otero as well. So she's twenty one or twenty two, probably like that. Um, an up and coming player who man, like. She's also had games where she scored zero points, so it's not like this is a locked-in guarantee, but I'm just saying she is a player. If the if the Fai are going to topple... Um, it's the Fai who's playing the car. Who was in it? Yeah. If they are going to cause a major upset, they're going to need some mad scoring, and there is someone coming off their bench, a young Kiwi player, who might be able to do something like that. Otherwise, you might just want to look to the opposite end of the spectrum and just be like, Michaela Cox is playing. I might not get too many other chances to watch her as a professional player playing in this country. 
might might want to take advantage of that you know <laughs> might want to make the most of that opportunity any opportunity to see the old mate uh the c wood the chris wood mr wood the woods woodsman uh score a goal for newcastle that's an opportunity you need to snap up as well and any chance for a kiwi in the champions league you got to snap that one up and any chance to see the football fans play games in the lead up to their world cup co-hosted by aotearoa these are all things that you need to snap up an opportunity to see or at least catch the wild cards uh, regurgitated thoughts and opinions on those matters which is what we are here to do we can kind of breeze through this these kind of football things here wild card you don't need to uh, give us the full rundown on chris wood's stature at newcastle or the historical um very good at your historical information around the champions league stuff like that so let's just kind of skim the surface chris wood trucking along with newcastle scoring goals what's the deal there are we are we simmering with excitement are we like because last year was kind of like chris wood yeah he's the kiwi in the premier league but he's kind of in batley situations niggly batley grindy situations in the best league so it's kind of a counterbalance so what's the deal with chris wood and newcastle how are you feeling yeah i mean like with Chris Wood at Newcastle, he was signed because Callum Wilson was injured and going to be out for a while, and they were battling relegation. Um, Callum Wilson is obviously going to be fit to start a new season, so that's meant that Wood hasn't played a whole lot, you know, for about half an hour of football in the first three Premier League games. Newcastle as a team looked pretty good. They had a great result against Man City, give it a thrill draw on the weekend. Really, like... I don't know, really seemed to cam come up with a nice tactical balance to to take on City, where they, like, sort of counter-pressed them a lot. And um, City didn't like it, you know? <laughs> Pep Guardiola was pretty frustrated on the sideline. Pretty annoyed that his team weren't able... And, it, you know, they had to... Obviously, they got tired by the end of it and then had to cling on. But that's when Chris Wood comes on for the last 20 minutes, puts in a defensive shift, makes sure his... Like, helps to make sure his team gets through there for a good result. What I didn't realize was that when he came on with 20 to go for Callum Wilson... Apparently, Carolyn Wilson, bit of a bit of a hamstring nickel there. So they don't really have any other strikers in the squad. And that's, that's a little bit of an issue for them. Hence why there's been a lot of rumors about guys who they might be signing. And they're, they're surely going to bring in someone because it's not like they're lacking in money. Their word this morning is that Alexander Isak, the Swedish striker who's been playing in Spain or Portugal or something, um, He's supposedly on the verge of arriving in a club record signing, which would not be a good thing for Chris Wood because he's a really good player and he would probably be playing ahead of him. Um, uh, there were rumoured, though, like I say, they, that sounds like it's on the verge of happening. Well, the other day, they were on the verge of signing João Pedro, a young Brazilian player from, from Watford, which actually would have been fine for Wood because I don't think Pedro would have been coming in and playing big minutes with, you know, you don't chuck on the 20 the 20 year old Brazilian prospect with 20 minutes to go when you're trying to hold on to a three all result against Man City. That's like Chris Wood territory, um, pure and simple. Um, but that, that supposed transfer was on the verge of happening and then suddenly it didn't happen and now they're moving for someone else. So, you know, grain of salt until anything's actually confirmed by a club in that situation. But they're probably going to sign another striker. And I mean, that, that might be be a little bit of a glimpse as to some pessimism about Callum Wilson more than Chris Wood though because Wilson has a history of hamstring injuries and just injuries in general he's had scans on this supposed thing they didn't think it's too bad of a tweak but it did really highlight and they haven't scans haven't come back so we don't know if he's going to be out for the weekend or if he's going to be out for a month or who knows um but he is a dude, like it's just highlighting again, he is a dude who is going to have a lot of injuries. And if he's missing games, Chris Wood's going to pop up and get opportunities. Um, League Cup this morning against Tranmere Rovers, League 2 team, which they made 10 changes for. Joe Willock was the only guy who started against City and started against Tranmere Rovers. So that was always going to be a game to highlight on the calendar for Chris Wood. Definitely going to be getting some big minutes there. He played the whole game. And he scored the winning goal. They actually conceded first. Uh, actually, really nice move from um, from uh, Tranmere Rovers sort of midway through the first half. But then, yeah, 
Newcastle equalised late second half, and then Karen Trippier, just a gorgeous corner kick right onto the head of Chris Wood, who wasn't going to miss from there, glancing, pow- powerful and yet glancing header um, into the other side of the net. Like, what do you, you know, runs off to celebrate in the crowd. Everyone loves him. That's all you got to do with your Chris Wood is you're not going to get big minutes necessarily throughout the season. But when you are called upon, if you can pop up with a goal here or there and a big, you know, energetic shift, putting, a, um, you know, doing winning a lot of headers and all this kind of stuff, that's fine. Like that's the blueprint for him. That's what he's got to do. So big, good boost for him to get that first goal of the season, even if it was against the League Two team. But it was the winning goal as well in a in a cup game. So that's it's good stuff. And to get that goal nice and early um, sets him up quite well, hopefully for the rest of the campaign because he's going to have to make the most of you know, spare inconsistent opportunities, we'll say, throughout uh, to play throughout the season. So when they do come around, you want to capitalize. That's what he did this morning. Bingo. There you go. You've been previewing Marco Staminich getting into the Champions League for a few weeks now. And that's happened by all accounts, according to the uh, our infamous Ravens that, that send us messages <laughs> and communicate with the, uh, the lords across Westeros. Um, what does that look like moving forward? Are there like just as ter- in terms of like I'm just thinking for the the audience, the listener, schedule, time frames, situations. Like, are they going to be in a pool with PSG and Barcelona and they're fucked? Like, what's what happens when Marco Staminic enters the Champions League as far as when those games are being played, who his opponents might be? Yeah, so um, FC Copenhagen's who he's playing for. He'd been like a youth player for them. He spent last season out on loan. So he's been there about two and a half years at this point. Um, that, yeah, like that. Just, just getting into the first team, like not being sent out on another loan, just getting into the first team was a bit of an achievement this season and shows like a couple of good pre-seasons in a row. He's obviously a player that they rate and they got um, high hopes for. He is only about... 20 years old probably um so he's he's not someone who necessarily makes every match day squad he he got 45 minutes in their first league game of the season he got about 12 after the game after that i think he was an unused sub the next game and then the game the two games they've played since uh, might have been three games since he hasn't actually been on the bench at all um part of the reason he got good minutes at the start is because their captain um was is a defensive midfielder and was out injured. So he, he comes back. Obviously, everyone else moves down one in the picking order in those positions. So that's what's happened to Staminic. But Champions League qualifiers against Trabzon Spore of Turkey, um, the Danish champions, reigning Danish champions against the reigning Turkish champions, um, did get about five minutes off the bench at the end of the first game. And the, what helped him there is that they have 12 man benches in Champions League qualifiers and they only had nine man benches in the Danish league. So the extra three subs allowed him to get onto a bench. He ended up actually playing as one of the other one of his teammates got poked in the eye late in that game and came in for that. Not a not a hamstring tear, not like a Spriggs up tackle or anything. He got poked in the eye and that's why he had to be subbed off. Um but good for Marco Stamanich. He didn't play in the second leg. Nil all draw away in Turkey, which is actually a massively commendable result because that is not an easy place to play, defending a one-goal lead. They did it, kept a clean sheet. Aussie Matt Ryan is their goalkeeper. They've just signed him recently, and he was fantastic across both those legs. So there's weird weird coincidence, weird Australasian football coincidence there. Um, Staminich, as I say, didn't play in that game. But I do think he would probably make the 25-man Champions League squad that you've got to name for that competition when you make it to the group stages. So I think he's a good chance of being on that list. I think he's probably in their top 25, even if he's not necessarily in their top, like, 18 to 20 or something like that. Doesn't mean he's any guarantee to play come the group stages. And they probably will get a team. I mean, they're not going to be a top-seeded team, are they? They're going to be a second or third um, seed. So they will get a team like Barcelona or PSG or, or, um, you know, Manchester City or or whoever, they're going to get someone like that in their group, um, potentially two teams like that in their group. Uh, They will not be favoured to go beyond that, but you never know. They're quite a good team, um, particularly through that midfield and in defence the last few games, they've looked really sharp. So 
they'll at least be a good competitive side. Hopefully, Marco Staminich does get out there at some point. It's like, it's no guarantee. Um, he's not exactly the first sub they'd want to bring off, the 20 year old youth player kind of thing, but he's going to be in the mix. And that's the important thing because, um, yeah, that historical thing that I keep mentioning is no Kiwi male has played in the Champions League since 2008. Um, only four fellas all time. It's, it's been a long wait and it's not been something I've been able to cover since, since I've been brightened in depth about Kiwi football. So it's about time as far as I'm concerned. And Marco Stamanić, Best bet for a long while. We've had some close calls. PSV, I think, with Ryan Thomas missed out at this quali last qualifying stage one year. Sapreet Singh obviously like got into the squad but didn't get onto the field or anything the year he was in the first team with Bayern Munich. So close calls. Hasn't quite happened yet. Here's the best chance we've had in a long time is Marco Staminich. So big ups to Marco. That brings us to the football ferns. We're off to Los Angeles. California for some uh, football games against Mexico and the Philippines, which uh, just seems a lot better than the old USA, Canada, Sweden um, type of opponents that we usually see the football fans play against. This little tour, imagine like, yeah, just going on tour to LA. Um, <laughs> seems like a Caribbean tour, like that type of situation. Bit better than the old... Uh, India, Sri Lanka tour. Um, the football ferns games, like this seems just seems like a better little series tour to get a gauge of who the football ferns are and what they're good at ahead of the World Cup. Slightly easier games, and we've got a squad announced for these games as well, Wild Card. What stands out as like some of the most important things about this tour or the squad named? Um, I'd say as to the tour, you've already made the point these are winnable games and that's pretty important for a team that's won like one of their last 20 games or so i can't remember what the stat is but it's they've, they've not won very many it was relatively recently they won that game again i think last november they beat south korea 2-0 so that's a good one to build from but the problem is a lot of the fixtures that they get especially when they're not like none of these are home games it'd be nice if they could play some home games at some point leading up to the world cup um hasn't happened yet and the main reason is just because it costs a lot of money to, to do that. Um, costs a lot of money to pay airfares for all the players to come back from overseas. Costs a lot of money to rent out a big-ass stadium or whatever. Like, New Zealand football is pretty poor, notoriously. Then, therefore, the games you end up playing are against teams that can afford to host them, which is often against the best teams like America, who are too good for us to be playing at this stage in our development. Like, you're trying to get the team to be able to play the ball through the midfield and, and hold position and create chances. Well, there's not much point doing that against a team where you're going to have 30% of position. Like you're just not going to get the opportunity to, to show off those patterns you've been working on at training. Um, these games are much better for that. And some of them were like, I mean, Wales last time was a good, was a good example of a, of a game where they, they drew nil all. They weren't able to find a goal, but it was an example to be able to show some of the progress they're trying to make. It doesn't happen in one game either. You got to play a bunch of these, which is why it's good that they had these all of a sudden games. They've had a game against Japan. They announced in like June or July that they were going to play Japan in October. And then all of a sudden they're like, we're going to play Mexico and Philippines in two weeks. And then they announce it in September and they announced it like two weeks beforehand. The other game gets announced like three or four months ahead of time. This one, like two weeks, but... I'm guessing that's just one of those took a while, took a lot longer to organize than we expected. And playing in neutral territory is probably why that was tricky. Um, not entirely neutral if you're playing Mexico and California, to be fair. I don't think that's going to feel like a neutral territory game for them. But, you know, the under 20s drew with Mexico at that World Cup a couple of weeks ago. Kate Taylor was a big part of that. Um, that's a decent indication of where that team's at. Um, Philippines are uh, the best they've ever been, um, coached by Alan Stajic, the former Australian coach as well, which is interesting. Um, but they're still a team that the Ferns should beat and should expect to beat. Um, but that's why it's an interesting game. Like they're, they're an informed team. They've been playing really well recently. They got a lot of dual nationals who have come through the American system and the Canadian system and things like that. So they, they will be tricky games, but they're the kind of tricky games where there can be a reward for the challenge. If you play well, you might actually win them. If you, if you like put out a, 
an eight out of ten performance, you can you can get some goals and maybe a result. So that's important. As to the squad, um, I don't know. It's it's similar in a lot of ways because the players who aren't there are mostly because of injury. Um, but I think one big factor, an elite is back. An elite has missed the last couple, last three tours, I think, to focus on her club career. She's since transferred from West Ham to Aston Villa, which probably helps settle things a, a little bit. She's back. However, in her absence over the last three tours, we've seen Vic Essen like just stake an undeniable claim for the number one goalkeeping jersey. Now, I would have said that An Elite was the, I still would say An Elite is the best goalkeeper of the three. Um, but, but Vic Essen's the one who's been informed, the one who's been playing, the one who has upended the longtime incumbent Aaron Naylor, who might drop back to third choice at the way this is um, the way this is going with lead back as well. But yeah, that's the risk you take if you're an elite and you don't go on three straight tours. Someone else might just come in and take the position that you were on. Not that wasn't hers to lose, but she was on the verge of maybe being able to to um, to claim it for herself. Vic Essen's done that in her absence. So that's a really funky aspect is the, the goalkeeping depth, I think. Because if you're a nail, it's your third choice. You're in a decent place. And that's with, like, Lily Offeld missed out on this squad. She's she's not done anything wrong for the Wellington Phoenix as a goalkeeper. So that's one interesting thing. Another one is Indy Riley. Is there India Page Riley? Um, one-time Australian captain as a national, but switching back to the, to the motherland. Um a right winger who has been playing a little bit of right wing back actually for Fortuna Hering in um in uh, Denmark recently. Speaking of making the Champions League and having to play against Barcelona, she did that in her first year as a professional, <laughs> as an eighteen year old. So there you go. Barcelona won the Women's Champions League that season too. Um, yeah, Indy Riley is exactly the kind of player that this team needs, like a creative right wing, um, just someone who can score goals, someone who can assist goals, someone who get forward, good athlete. Like They've just been absolutely begging for international caliber players in those kind of positions. And it's just sneakily, I like. I, I might have almost chuck Jackie Hand in there as well, given what she's doing in Finland, like five goals and three assists playing. More as an attacking midfielder than a wide player. I think she's sort of would be seen more as a wide player for the Ferns. But it's not been the case for a long time. It's not been the case ever, actually, for the for the football fans. But just recently, you know, a little bit more depth in terms of high le- like professionals playing at a high level overseas in attacking positions, scoring goals, setting up goals. It's it's a rare thing, but it's a little you know a little bit more of that happening now than there has been in the past. Can you just off the top of your head rattle off all the uh, goalkeepers from Aotearoa in the top flight? Like you mentioned three or four on the women's side. Off the top of my head, comprehension. Uh, Vic Essen, Lily Oldfield, Rebecca Stott. Victoria Essen. Victoria Essen. I said Vic Essen. I said Lily Oldfield, Vic Essen, um, Emily Naylor, sorry. And Aaron Rumble. Naylor, yeah. Keep us going. Keep us going. <laughs> um, I, I, I got confused by the list now when you ran through it twice. Vic Essen, Lily Ophald, Anna Elite, and Aaron Anna. Naylor are the four big ones on the women's side. Yeah, so we got four pretty impressive women's goalkeepers on the women's side and on the men's side. I'm thinking uh, nothing. Enlighten me. Well, you should be thinking Oli Sale, uh, Stefan Marinovic, Michael Vald, um, dropping down perhaps a tear, Nick Sanev, Max Krokum, um, uh, Matthew Gould's been in a couple of squads without actually playing, um, Jamie Searle is another one. All those four guys I just mentioned coincidentally play lower leagues in England. Um, Jamie Searle is at Barnsley, he hasn't played for them. He's like the third choice goalkeeper. Um, so he can get a chance at some point. Um, that's in League One. Crokem and Sinev are in League Two, and Gould is in the National League below League Two. So, so that's, coincidentally, all those guys in England. But that's that's a that's a fair crop. That's roughly ten. Alex but, Paulson coming through at the uh, Wellington Phoenix is a really good prospect as well. Zach oh Jones gosh. is playing in Wales, um, not a particularly high level, but it's Greg Draper did all right there for several years in Wales, so that's not bad. 
So that's at least 10 high quality goalies from Aotearoa, let alone, you know, the rest of our Aotearoa sporting abundance that we regularly consistently celebrate. Um, and we've always highlighted that there's at least 20 high quality cricketers from Aotearoa, sometimes pushing 30, depending on who the opponent is. Like we can roll out the 20 to 30 players and defeat a few teams around the world. More recently, it's been condensed down to some uh, full strength outfits wildcard. We got something close to a full strength kind of T20 outfit specifically ahead of that T20 World Cup in the West Indies. And now we've got an ODI squad to face Australia in some, uh, what do they call it? The Hadley Chapel series. And it's as per, like, I don't think there's any great surprises. Uh, we are um, nerds for, uh, nerds for notes. How about that one? And one of the notes in the, uh, from this announcement is, and regularly, regular in these type of announcements from New Zealand cricket is the players not selected due to injury, um, which means absolutely fuck all, but shout out to Kyle Jamison. He got a shout out for his back injury and Adam Milne got a shout out for his Achilles injury. Good for them. Um, and it's funny because that appears on the New Zealand cricket announcement. So then the Crick Info announcement has to include the same thing, even though it has no relevance to the announcement at all. Because I think this is a fairly good ODI squad. And let alone guy like I don't, we kind of forecasted East Sodi's non selection in the ODI squad. That just feels fine. East Sodi's a world class T20 bowler. And he's a, probably second in line to Mitch Santner for ODI spinner role. Um, but now we're seeing Michael Bracewell's batting is also highly beneficial to balance out that ODI team. So that's all good. Uh, Will Young is scoring runs in England's One Day Cup. Like him and Henry Nichols are both high quality batters. But they are outside this ODI first 11 right now because Finn Allen has... Uh, had a nice little rise, but he's probably outside the first 11 as well. If you're looking at a top three, Guptill, Conway, Williamson, um, and then you're trying to fit in Daryl Mitchell, Tom Latham, like all those lads are pretty good. And then it's Finn Allen. So I don't think it's necessarily, um, well, Finn Allen is selected ahead of those other guys, but um, in a backup role. And I think there's value to rolling with guys like Ben, uh, Ben Sears and Finn Allen in these type of squads. And I would suggest that their selection, of course, Gary Stead is like, well, we're going to Australia. We need hard, fast, bouncy bowlers. Fair enough. There is also value in selecting some of these lads, younger players, up and coming players to tour with the squad. Like that's what we've seen with Tom Blundell, Will Young. Daryl Mitchell, Matt Henry, they all sat in the squad for a long time, soaking up the wisdom and insights of their elders, their kaumatua in that black cap setup. So that's interesting. Um, and well, cut another interesting note, I'd say. Jimmy Neesham playing a lot of cricket without a contract. The whole point of Jimmy Neesham not getting a contract as told by the media is one of the most important things we've ever seen was that he had fell out of the ODI setup. Well, he's in the ODI squad. He was in the last ODI squad and he's still playing a lot of cricket for Aotearoa. So between him and Trent Bolt, we're seeing that you can still play a lot of cricket for Aotearoa without a contract. And just because you don't have a contract does not mean your days playing for Aotearoa are limited or numbered because Jimmy Nisham and Trent Bolt, they're still playing a lot of cricket. Both of them are also, though, in the BBL draft. And I'd say this is where some of the contract stuff is most pertinent. Because if you do have a New Zealand contract, there's no way you can play BBL. But Jimmy Nisham's entered that draft with uh, Latudu Taylor. He's in the draft as well, um, as well as like Colin Munro and I think Mitchell McLennigan. Trent Bolt was a platinum player, so he's a big Donny. So he's a, he's in demand, and then the others have just entered the regular draft. So that's it. Black Caps ODI squad feels about per. Some would say the shock selection of Glenn Phillips ahead of someone like Will Young or Henry Nichols, but this is Aotearoa cricket, and 
there are a lot of very good players. We've basically settled on a group of 20 who are capable of stepping up. Like we've never, we haven't even mentioned someone like Conde Granholm, you know, like there's 20 high quality cricketers in Aotearoa and it's just vibe. Like it's just, who do you want to roll with in that moment? And this is what they've gone with. So I don't think someone like Ben Sears is going to be relied upon for much in the series. And so I don't, um, um, let me put it this way. I'd rather Ben Sears goes in that squad as part for an experience rather than selecting Blair Tickner or Jacob Duffy just as a straight-up backup bowler. Like, I'd want to see Ben Sears getting more experience in that Black Caps environment as a and part of the development process. As he got in the West Indies when he was called up to replace an injured Matt Henry and didn't play any of those games, but was around the environment and no doubt oh, bowling a fair bit in the nets and things like that. Um, does Ben Sears have a New Zealand cricket contract? No. And yet he's in the squad. <laughs> At the expense of presumably there's got to be someone with a contract who's not in there. HS Patel isn't in there, is he? So, um, well, so though, Remember the big yarn about this contract stuff is... Gary Stead, he's got to say this again. These people yeah. have to say this. But it's like, we're going to prioritize people with contracts and it's not going to happen. Like, this is why the contracts don't matter because in no way, shape or form are you going to prioritize selecting uh, someone with a contract. Neil Wagner's got a contract, right? Colin de granholm has got a contract. But neither of them was mentioned as being injured. So one would assume they are available for selection and yet, they were not selected because that makes no sense apart from having contracts. Instead, three players, Bolt, Nisham, and Sears, are select. Fennellan doesn't have a contract. There you go. So all these Another players one. without contracts are being selected ahead of players with contracts. So it just kind of uh, validates this whole idea that we've been talking a lot about. Yeah, that's... yeah. When Gary Stead and um and whoever like comes out and says exact like says what you're talking about there, like we there will be times where Trent Bolt understands that he won't be picked because we have to um we have to like you know pick the dude who's been given a centralized contract or whatever. Like it's that's a frustrating thing to hear, but you have to wait and see. Like the the in practice version of that is like. Is he just saying this to protect the like integrity of New Zealand cricket's system, like contracting system, or is he saying it because he means it? I think we're seeing now. Like, is Trent Bolt is in this team? Trent Bolt is in the squad. We thought maybe he wouldn't be in the squad. Trent Bolt's in the squad. Uh, he's playing these games against Australia, which is quite good timing actually. If it's coming right before the BBL draft, like remind everyone how good he is, <laughs> like to an Australian audience, um, get a bunch of their best players out. And, across these three games it's it's quite nice but also like you know ross taylor wanted to go to australia that's this is that series ended up being postponed until now but he wanted to go to australia to finish off his career kind of thing as well like um i remember brendan mccullum hanging around at the end of his career to it was when australia came here to play against them um before he retired kind of thing like Black Caps guys do want to play against Australia. That is a this is a big series. It's a um, it's a rivalry, which is only a rivalry from one side because I don't think Australia care about us that much. But we have to beat them in order to get them to care about us. So that's fair enough. And um, Trent Bolt was, from memory, I think the best bowler for the Black Caps in the 2020 World Cup final against Australia, which we lost. So there's probably a little bit of I don't know unfinished business there as well, but point being i was i mean what would the what would the 11 look like if you if you picked like the best possible black caps odi team with only uncontracted players it would still be pretty good wouldn't it <laughs> you'd have finn allen opening you'd have trent bolt bowling you'd have probably ben sears in there um jimmy nisham as well obviously like the four guys are in the squad without contracts I don't know what the contract list is off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure you could find some very good players who are on the fringes of that as well, who also would have, who also, A, wouldn't go astray, um, given your good black ass performances at that level. Also, B, 
probably have played for the Black Caps the last 12 months and done really well, um, particularly over some of that, like, you know, the start of the European League and things like that. So weird situation, mostly just because of the focus it gets when it actually isn't a focus. But I'm looking forward to a series against Australia because this is actually a strong team. Um, I I like the balance of that Black Caps team. I, I don't like it as much as I could, but I do think, like, because the only change from the West Indies ser- series here is that Matt Henry's back from injury and he replaces East Sodi. I thought East Sodi should have been playing all three of those games in the West Indies, but in Australia, you don't need a second spinner nearly so much as you might have in the West Indies. And Matt Henry is really good and he's fit and available this time. Fine. There's no problems there. I mean... Yeah, Will Young and Henry Nichols have been dropped very unfortunately. Like, it's just bad convenience for them. It's like, you know how the Black Caps, they pick dudes and they stick with them for a fair while. You sort of got to play your way out of the team once you've been given that kind of blessing. Neither of those guys have done that. What they've done is, you know, Henry Nichols has been asked to be an opener in, in, internet, in ODI cricket, top scored in the World Cup final, been very good since. Like, you've done nothing wrong. But just convenience, he he's not a 2020 player, so he wasn't on that sort of dual 2020 ODI squad that went to the West Indies and other people did well in his absence. And he's just sort of fallen off the back of the wagon. Will Young as well, like, done nothing wrong. Scored an ODI century, I'm pretty sure, from memory. Um, might have even had two, I can't remember. But, like, also maybe he only plays if someone else's like uh, he was playing because others were missing at that time um and like just glenn phillips and finn allen are also really good players and if they weren't picked and will young and henry nichols were picked then we'd be arguing well why didn't you pick finn allen after he scored 97 against the windy west indies what's glenn phillips got to do to get an extended chance in the odi team first choice t20 player kind of thing like give him a chance um it's either way like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't but that's a good place for the black caps to be in when those kind of things because if one of these guys does get injured get will young on the plane you don't lose anything for like guys like will young and uh henry nichols i don't think it's anything they do right like no, it's, exactly yeah it's what finn Which allen is why did. it's unfair for them but also that's that's what depth looks like and like <clears throat> there's so much mindfulness from professional athletes that i think everyday jokers can apply to their real life like one game at a time is actually important advice for a regular joker one day at a time just focus on what and focus on what you can control rather than what you can't control these are all like sporting mindfulness that that a lot of like regular folks like scoff at as cliches but maybe take that advice on board and actually apply it to your day-to-day life and you'll be happier um but for like someone like will young he can only control what he can control. He can't do anything about Finn Allen playing one of the best knocks of his life, considering what we know about Finn Allen as a slugger. He didn't do that against the West Indies in that ODI. He showed growth. He showed development. And I don't know, like it's not anything Henry Nichols is doing wrong, but Daryl Mitchell gets better with every game he plays. And Glenn Phillips gets better as well. And then the opportunity will fall to Will Young or Henry Nichols or Isodi, and they will perform. And then they will get a flow-on effect with that momentum as well. So it's, I think it, we can kind of view it as like an isolated case. Like it's rough for Will Young, it's rough for uh, Henry Nichols or whoever else, but the Black Caps, my read of their selection process is whoever's just, doing the job you stick with them like why has michael bracewell come out of nowhere to play a lot of cricket for the black caps because he just does his job a lot of the time and yeah you can argue his place in each of these teams and you could say this player is better or that player is better but most recently it's been michael bracewell doing a job and that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what um, Colin de Gronholm's doing. It doesn't matter what Isodi's doing. It matters what the guys who are getting that opportunity right now do. And if they slip up with that opportunity, there's a bunch of 
Hungry Mofos. Was, uh, for some reason, a rap lyric like, there's, uh, they, like an Eminem. There's a hundred motherfuckers just like me. Like that's the type of thing. There's, uh, there's like not a hundred, but there's at least twenty a to half, thirty. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, in this in this context, there's like five motherfuckers hungry for that opportunity. So the moment Michael Bracewell doesn't perform, the moment Finn Allen stops his growth, the moment Daryl Mitchell encounters bad form. When you've got this depth that Aotearoa cricket has, someone else steps up. And then you have to, like, for Finn Allen, if he slips up and someone else takes his opportunity, he's not straight back in there. No, you've got to get better. You've got to get better and then wait for your opportunity. And this is, the, uh, this is one of the crux ideas of a good team culture, is you have to get better yourself and then take your opportunity and that just kind of keeps the team at a highly competitive level because the dude doing his job right now he's doing his job he's performing and then if someone else gets their opportunity they know they have to take their opportunity and perform and i think we've seen that already like anytime matt henry plays he takes wickets uh finn allen has taken his opportunity michael bracewell started this year in a new zealand 11 against Netherlands and at each level he took his opportunity and that's all you can ask for so but the moment you don't take your opportunity someone else is gunning someone else is coming for that and they're posing a threat and it's a highly competitive environment which I think like again black caps and white ferns a lot of this swings back around to domestic cricket and a little bit of buzz a bit of hype for domestic cricket because you're going to have East Sodi Will Young, Henry Nichols, um, those type of lads. Ben Sears might not get selected for the T20 World Cup. So then he's bowling in Plunkett Shield. And what are these lads doing in domestic cricket to ensure that they get another opportunity? And it's just, it all flows through the formats and the uh, just the excitement for all this cricket. So I think what we're seeing with the Black Caps are clear indicators of a of depth and a high quality team environment but i've got a i've uh, i actually talked around what i was actually thinking about and the dude with the biggest opportunity wildcard is tim salvi i was just i was going to say that yeah i was just <laughs> about to say that we're we're in alignment um because we know tim salvi he's out of the first 11 but he was quite good in the west indies his stats like he averaged over 30 for nine consecutive years or something like that. He's averaged over 40 in ODI bowling for three out of the last four years. That's why he's not a first 11 player. But if Trent Bolt's playing less cricket moving forward, it's going to be Tim Southey's might be the key benefactor. And this series might be crucial in Tim Southey reclaiming some ODI game time. Yeah, I find it hard to see Ben says getting any kind of a look in on this tour. Um, but as you said before, that's fine. He's there to soak it up. Um, I'm also finding it hard to decide how they're going to... Uh, you can't pick Michael Bracewell and Daryl Mitchell and whoever else and uh, Jimmy Nisham all together and still have four frontline seamers is, is an issue. Um, we saw this in the, with their wonky bowling lineups in the, in the West Indies, which means Matt Henry coming back, who's been a, like, one of the things you're saying before is like, it's, you know, Henry Nichols and Will Young have been dropped for doing nothing wrong. Being good, like being good enough is not enough <laughs> to hold your place in the Black Caps at the moment. Um, but Matt Henry is above that. Matt Henry's not just been good enough. He's been better than good enough. Like he's, he's arguably been their best one-day bowler outside of Trent Bolt going back, um, at least pace bowler, going back the last three or four years kind of thing. Like he's, he's a really, really good ODI bowler. Um, he has taken Tim Southey out of the first 11, but Tim Southey was the Black Caps' best bowler probably in the, in the West Indies series. Fantastic. So I'm what, like seven wickets at 15s or something like that. Um, also, 
an experienced head who's toured Australia a couple of times before, which is quite important when you're playing away to a very good Australian team, which is always a very good Australian team when you're playing away to them. Like, you kind of want him in there. You kind of want Matt Henry in there too. Kind of want Trent Bolt because he's available. He's a left-hander and he's like the most talented of all these dudes. You kind of want Lockie Ferguson too, though. He's the point of difference. He's the pace bowler, you know. Um, you can't really pick all four unless you want to, like... You can't really pick all four unless you want to drop Michael Bracewell or Jimmy Neesham or someone like that. And we know how much they like to stack their middle order batting lineup um, as deep as possible. That's a that's a that's a conundrum. That's a conundrum for Gary Stead and Kane Williamson and whoever else to figure out. It's uh, easily solved though. Like Mitchell Santner goes up to number three, Jimmy Nation number <laughs> <There you> four. <laughs> Easy. Like don't worry about it. Don't worry about Problem it. Problem solved. Um NRL rugby league wildcard. I want to keep it just uh focused as we finish our podcast on the fringe top eight group. So there's this whole thing like, uh, and I don't like anytime the uh, broadcast rights holder is part of the media, they want every game to be a humdinger, right? Like Lord forbid a team loses by 40 points. And then it's like, we need an inquiry into the state of the competition. There's too many blowout losses. No, it's late in the season and the best teams played the worst teams and that happens. And also, these trends are happening in New South Wales Cup, Queensland Cup. Like, teams are scoring 50 points right now as well. So anytime you're seeing this um, Australian idea about all these blowouts and we need to fix this and sort this out, chill the fuck out. Like, it's just late season footy. It happens every year. Nothing's different. And this week is different. Because you don't have, like, you got the worst teams playing the worst teams. Like, the Warriors might get smoked by Penrith. That's realistic. And that's you, probably likely, yeah. Yeah, but your Dragons, they're facing the Gold Coast Titans. No, no, no. The Titans are facing the Knights. That's a humdinger, bam, burn of that one. And then you got the Dragons, your Dragons versus the Tigers. That's another humdinger. Both on Sunday has... Might be a good might be a good afternoon to mow the lawns or something. <laughs> well, if if uh, if the dragons put on fifty against the tigers, now 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 it's a bit more interesting. If the titans uh, put fifty on the knights, then it's also interesting. But last week you had good teams playing bad teams. This week you've got the good teams playing the good teams and the bad teams playing the bad teams. So again, it's all good. It's just late season footy. This is what happens in a competition. My focus, so the Panthers, Cowboys, Sharks, Storm, they're kind of locked in. I'd say the Parramatta Eels are also locked in. And then, obviously, we've got the shit teams. Dragons, Sea Eagles, Bulldogs, Warriors, Knights, Titans, and Tigers. Friendly reminder, there's always a team worse than the Warriors. At least, or maybe two teams, maybe three teams, maybe four teams. But um, no matter how you feel about it in Aotearoa, there's always a team worse than the Warriors. On the field and off the field. But the Warriors don't have the same drama as other clubs, so maybe just uh, sipping some gratitude there. So I'm most interested in this group wildcard. Roosters, Rabbitohs, Broncos, and Raiders. The Broncos face the Eels tonight. And the Eels are in fifth spot on 30 points. So they're also in this group, but I think... Um, the Eels should be okay. And that is based on the idea that I think, I kind of hope, I want, I think they will, Eels to defeat the Broncos. Uh, Roosters. The Roosters face the Storm. So that's a fantastic contest in itself. We have the Rabbitohs. They face the Cowboys. Another fantastic matchup. And then we've got the Raiders versus Sea Eagles. And I said earlier in the show that my team here in this little pocket is the Raiders. That is based upon uh, Joseph Tarpane, who is first in post-contact meters. Joseph Tarpane is the only player in the NRL 
with over 1,400 post-contact meters. Only one. Shout out Wellington Rugby League. And Joseph Tarpane is also third in offload. So just think about that package as a rugby league player. He's first in post-contact meters by a decent margin, and he's third in offloads. So he'd be further ahead in post-contact meters if he didn't keep offloading the ball all the time. Exactly. And that, like, when someone tells you about Giannis Antetokounmpo, like, there's this basketball player, and he's this, and he's that, he's got this stature, he's got this skill set, you're like, that guy sounds good at basketball. Yeah. If, if I said to you, there's a middle forward from Wellington, and he's first in post-contact meters and third in offloads, you're thinking this guy's good at... Uh, carting the footy up through the middle of the uh, toughest rugby league competition in the world and he's also representing Aotearoa Kiwis alongside other fantastic players so I'm kind of on this Raiders wagon wildcard I want to see the Raiders get into finals footy they face the Manly Sea Eagles shout out to Raymond Tuaimalo Vainga he is a Maris Saints junior he's going to debut for the Sea Eagles on the wing and um, which is good for him Unfortunately, the Sea Eagles are one of these teams with a stinky vibe, so don't know what's doing there. How are you feeling? Like, Do you have any questions about this Roosters, Rabbitohs, Broncos, Raiders crop? My prediction, or more so what I want to happen, is I want the Raiders to get in ahead of the Broncos. Not sure why. Can't explain why. Like Jordan Rickey from Christchurch, he's cool. Tamaita Martin from the Waikato, he's cool as well. He's playing fullback. Um, the Broncos did shuffle Dean Mariner out. He might be injured because he's not playing reserve grade either. Um, so the Broncos have some cool Kiwi and flavor, but I'm more enticed by the Raiders, a bit of Matthew Tamoko, a bit of Corey Harawera Naira as well. So any talking points for you in that middle crop of teams that your Dragons dipped out of uh, recently? Well, the, yeah, <laughs> The Dragons did their best to dip out of it. it was, there were consecutive games in, a, in like week after week where they they were in it trying to come... Well, they were playing from behind, but they had a chance to come back in the last play of the game and both times just came up with stupid ways to lose it. Um, to be fair, at least when they lost to, on the last play of the game to... Was it the Raiders? Was it it might have been the Raiders um, where... There was like there was should have been a penalty in the last play. Someone held down and the right ref doesn't want to give it. It was exactly what happened on the flip side when the Dragons beat them earlier on in the season. So that was pretty funny. Um, We're not here. To sort of thing you'd normally story. be infuriated about as a fan, but then when it's like, well, you know, easy come, easy go. <laughs> to be fair, I'm a hypocrite if I complain. But they are out of it. Dragons have been out of it for a couple of weeks, realistically, but now almost mathematically. But what's really interesting about that is Roosters, Rabbitohs, Broncos all on 28 points, quite a bit of like big significant differences in um, points difference between the three of them. Um, Raiders are two points back on 26. But as you just highlighted with all the fixtures that are coming up this week, Raiders have the most winnable game playing against the Seagulls. If they can win that and potentially win it by enough to get their points difference somewhere close to challenge Brisbane, they like... The Broncos, Rabbitohs, and Roosters all have potentially losable games this week. Like, they all have tough fixtures, which you can easily conceive them not getting the points. Four teams tied on 28 points going into the final round of the season with only three of them able to make the, the top eight. That's legitimately a possibility going, going into the final week of the season. That's pretty nuts. Um, would also say that far outweighs the the um the crisis of a bunch of round 23 20 plus point hidings being dished out across the board <laughs> again a really close competition going into the last week of the season is is a much better sign um but that's yeah that's that's a fascinating fascinating little battle and whichever of the roosters rabbitohs and broncos can like some one of them is going to i don't see them all winning games um Potentially, potentially they could. But, you know, if, if someone drops points, like anyone who can win is going to put themselves in a major boost for qualifying for the next round, um, qualifying for the finals. 
anyone who like doesn't leaves themselves potentially potentially vulnerable to the Raiders coming up and swooping for their spot. That's just like fascinating areas um, across the board and exactly what you want to see going into the last round of the, well, the going into the last two rounds, but especially going into the last round after this round is done. Um, that's, that's good stuff. That's, that's, that's good NRL areas. The Raiders versus Seagulls game, Matthew Tomoko, he might line up against Morgan Harper, which would be interesting. Little battle there. Also, Toi Malo Vainga's debut means that the Sea Eagles have Kieran Foran, Christian Tuipalotu, Morgan Harper, and Toi Malo Vainga as four out of seven backline players from Aotearoa. So that's quite cool as well. And when I met, talk through the uh, Kiwi NRL stuff, especially some of the Wellington stuff on the Variety Show, overlook Jordan Rapana. And I, I said Ronaldo Molotalo would be the winger, best winger, one of the best wingers. And then I put Timaida Martin on the wing of that all-star team. Obviously, Jordan Rapana should be on the wing. And I the Kiwis had Ronaldo Molotalo and Jordan Rapana as their starting wing combination against Tonga. I like that type of winger. Like, there's other types of wingers. You've got a, like a Kim Mamalo power winger. You've got an Xavier Coates type of athlete winger. Uh, who, who else do we have as wingers? Daniel Tupo and uh, Joseph Suali'i. Again, very athletic wingers. I've got a bit of a fetish for the uh, just the funky winger who can do it all. Like when you think of Jordan Rapino and Ronaldo Molotalo, you're thinking these dudes just pop up everywhere. They're aggressive. They're niggly. They're just natural footy players, and I think that is quite valuable on the wing. And because I forgot about him, and then I remembered post show, and I was like, "Fuck, forgot about Jordan Rapino." So I do, do want to celebrate Jordan Rapino as well because. He just pops up everywhere. He's gone off low. He's tackle buster. He's, like, all wingers have to be good at scoring tries, right? So whether it's diving over the corner flag, whether it's um, making sure you get low close to the try line, if you're trying to steam over the top of someone, obviously you have to good, be good on those early tackles out of your own defensive line. When, when you think about Melbourne Storm, what's changed about them recently, they brought in David Noah for Luma, and Coates. So suddenly your set of six starts with a few more aggressive carry, carries as opposed to a reserve grader trying to take on those important carries. Look at the Roosters, Joseph Suali'i. He's taken the set, second hitter. Like even off a kickoff, they'll go like Jared White Hargraves or Matt Lodge. And then it's Suali'i coming in for a carry as well. So there's, that is to say, there's a wide skill set and many ways that a winger has to contribute to the game. And they're all different. They've all got different styles, different body stature. I love the Mulatalo Rapana types. Like, it's just something weird about them that I think, and their natural skill set that I like. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a combination that isn't going to lead you astray. Um, there's, yeah, I don't know. Um, where else do we want to go with that? It does, I don't have anything to add to the winger combination other than saying, yeah, good point. I agree with that. Um, any, any other, any, the NRL guy, any other things to chuck in the last couple of minutes? Let's go to the old well, the Dragons opponent. Um, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> you're going to come. So I mentioned the uh, Seagulls. Tigers have Stafford Toa, Asuke Pa'oa, and Junior Ponga. Junior Ponga comes back into the Tigers team on the wing. So you're going you're gonna to be in for an interesting Kiwi NRL matchup there. You've got three youngsters from Aotearoa. Uh, Fa'amanu Brown from Christchurch moves from hooker to, to lock forward. So that's interesting. The one you will probably want to watch out for, shout out Austin Diaz, Tani Faro Jr. as well in that Tigers outfit, is Kalmatua Langi. Because he's off to the Sea Eagles next season, I believe. And the Dragons have two pretty good uh, edge forwards. Like Josh Maguire does a job. He's not a threat. He does a job. 
and Jaden Sewer. Jaden Sewer is a threat. He smashes yeah. blokes and he does his job as well. So whoever Kamatoa Lungi is lining up against, Maguire or Jaden Sewer, I'd recommend to you to watch out for J uh, Kamatoa Lungi and just his work on an edge. Yep, locked and loaded. I've, I've had some good ones in the last couple of weeks from uh, Griffin Niami to like, um, I think Matthew Tomoko was another one. And I don't know if we got a shout out for last week's one for the time. No, but you did have uh, Paul Turner starting center. Yeah, I, I was surprised to see that. I was even more surprised to see him at center, but you, you get in where you fit in. He did a, he did a, he did a nice solid game um, for a team that lost by 20 odd points, but was a close game up until the last Weird one. It was a close game up until the Dragons got a red card. And then suddenly the Dragons ran away with it. <laughs> strange, and the, strange thing. Titans are also playing like props at hooker. So mm. I'm not going to judge any other Kiwi NRL Titans player, especially a center where like you think about the f distribution flow. Yeah. Starts at hooker. And if you're playing, like I think Jared, like you, Jared Wallace. He came, like Sam McIntyre started a hooker. Jared Wallace came in to do some hooker minutes, was terrible, and he got burned by Teletawa Mone. And the yeah. commentator's like, what the fuck's uh, Jared Wallace defending there? And then you see the next set of six, he's playing hookers. Like, yeah. he's playing hooker. Well, that, that's why he's there. Okay. <laughs> and you're never going to win games with Jared Wallace playing minutes at hooker. So, unfortunately for Paul Turner, playing center, you're not getting good footy. Like, if. if if you're putting uh, Sam McIntyre or Jared Wallace at hooker. So shout out to Kiwi NRL. Finals footy is, is coming. So we're a bit of excitement brewing. Domestic rugby league is simmering as well. Pick it up to yourself. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Chur chur.